um, some things are, I'll just weave a few things together, the things that are really um, present for me right now. Um, the things that Manish was saying, those um, kind of burned some images in my brain. Um, the young person who probably could have gone to a top university instead going to take care of his father who's dying of cancer. The, the indigenous people refusing to sell their forest because the gods live there. Uh, the woman sharing water. The, the Ramu in the story offering the visitor from New York, whatever meager things he had available, standing in a kind of a generosity that is unknown, perhaps, to the man from New York. I mean, perhaps that, that, that sharing of a meal represented half of Ramu's net worth. How would it be to feel that free, to, be, to feel that secure in the world, that you're willing to share almost everything that you have? and not need to accumulate to feel secure. And the other thing that's sitting with me right now is um, Santos' song. You still back there, Santos? Yo. Uh, I changed the world by changing me. And I want to um, observe that that one could misinterpret that and say, I don't have to bother changing the world, all I have to do is change me, and the world will magically change thereby. That's kind of um, a perverse um, form of New Age thinking that is not accurate. Um, because there's a second part. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a second part to that. I change the world by changing me. It's also I change me by changing the world. Because as we go out there and have these interactions and relationships, we discover parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed um, and are called upon to offer gifts that we didn't know we had. It's normal and expected that self and world are linked in this way because we are not, and this, is, this has been coming up again and again, Helena said it, our fundamental oneness with all of life. We are not separate from the world. And I ask, what is this alliance really about? What, what are we allies in? We sense sometimes an alliance, and we're trying to feel it out. You know, what is um, racial justice, healing racism? What does that really have to do with climate change? And we can talk about environmental justice and things like that, and we're starting to get an inkling that, yeah, these things are related, but what does that have to do with, with um, you know, holistic uh, healing modalities and, 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 we, and, and, and regenerative agriculture. And what does that have to do with quitting school to go take care of your dying father for a year? We sense that we are allies in the same thing as we pursue these different things. And I think that what unifies us is that we are all in service to a new and ancient story of who we are, what the world is, what reality is, and how to interact with it, and how things change. We, and I say we to mean the dominant culture, have lived in a certain story for a long, long time. A story of separation from each other, separation from nature. And yeah, we have like this inkling that that is not a true story. We have an inkling that what we do to the world, we do to ourselves, and that what happens to any human being and any species is happening to ourselves. But our ideology and our economic system militate against that understanding. For example, to bring up Manisha's topic, uh, you know, being put into a classroom where your performance is compared against the performance of everybody else, it certainly looks that looks very much like what happens to you isn't happening to me. And in a competitive economic system, an artificially competitive economic system, where money is created through interest-bearing debt so that there's never enough of it, then it certainly looks like your good fortune is contrary to my good fortune. As well, speaking of the money system, 
Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but the system necessitates endless growth in order to survive. One place that, hmm, one thing I'd like to, <laughs> you know, there's so many things that, that you know, as we, we dig into this, um, what localization really is, what it really requires, what's really changing today, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And the things that we had once questioned as, as unequivocal, unequivocal goods, like education, I mean, certainly that's good. Uh, building medical clinics in other places, that's good, right? Bringing development to them. Um, I mean, these, these were all unquestioned. Uh, and now we are understanding that these are all part of the same big picture. Even, um, even as Camilla was saying, the climate change issue, something that, that is um, a sacred cow, um, something that you, that, and Camilla was very brave to even bring that, um, bring that dark side of, uh, you know, carbon reduction. Um, even that is very much part of the dominant way of looking at the world that says, for one thing, well, why should you care about climate change? Why should you care about carbon? Well, if you don't, we won't have a planet to live on. In other words, we should care about it because of the effect on us. That's not a very deep revolution. That kind of thinking is the thinking of money, maximizing utility, instrumental utilitarianism. How do we make decisions to bring the maximum possible benefit? But so it's really part of the same mentality of self separate from world, world existing in order to maximize the benefits from self, goodness, well-being coming through the control of that which is outside of ourselves. And how do you do that? You do that through the measurement of everything outside of yourself, the objectification of it. So therefore, well, I'll just say where we need to go is to see nature as something sacred, something alive, so that we don't preserve this rainforest in order to offset the carbon of some other rainforest that we're cutting down and we kind of add up the figures and we make the decision based on that. We preserve it because the ancestors are buried there. We preserve it because it's sacred. We preserve it because we love it. Because we see it as a being deserving of life and not as a pile of instrumental stuff whose value depends on its girth at chest height. That is a much deeper kind of revolution. And that, to me, bespeaks the necessity of, of really going beyond economic localization, although it's, that's an inseparable part of it, but to what bio might call epistemological localization, where we understand that our way of seeing the world is part of the problem. And and, and understand that we are so conditioned to that that we are almost helpless in our unthinking replication of it in everything that we do, which calls upon us to maybe stop. Uh, Elizabeth this morning was making that point as well, that we can't just parachute in with our made-in-America solutions and say, well, you know, we were wrong about the mega dams and the nuclear power plants and the centralized infrastructure, but now we know the solution. So listen to us this time. How do we know that we're not reenacting the same pattern? So there comes a moment to stop and to listen and, and to, to the things that we've marginalized, to the things that are local to every place on earth. Not only their ways of living in relationship to the land, but also their ways of knowing, their stories, their theories of change. And it's not like we're learning anything new from them. And I'm not saying that there's not a role for two-way interchange that's based on humility. But it can't be based on, we know better than you. Fortunately, that delusion is becoming harder to maintain as the promise of technological utopia has been betrayed, even among the 1%. The blowback 
is getting harder to ignore. And maybe if you have a high enough wall, you can keep out the criminals. And if you, have, if you import all of your organic food from somewhere far away, you can seemingly insulate yourself against the uh, incinerator. And if you live in a you know, nice enough community, well, it's not really a community when you don't really know your neighbors and don't depend on them and look at every face and know that I don't really need you. But you can maintain the illusion for a while of insulation from the things that we've done to the earth. But you know, it kind of creeps back in. And underneath the facade of the Mr. 1% with his yacht and his McMansion and his vacation home, you know, what is there? There's depression, there's addiction, there's angry teenagers, there's autoimmune diseases, there's marital discord, there's misery, there's, and there's not even security, there's not even the security that money promises, not the security that Ramu has, where he feels at liberty to be generous because he knows that his community will take care of him because he has seen every day of his life that whoever is in need is taken care of by the rest of the community. Therefore, his economic lived experience confirms what to us has been a mere spiritual principle, this oneness, this what's good for you is good for me. He's seen it every day of his life. That's what we are rebuilding now or striving toward. And I would say that we don't know how to do it. We see the dissolution of our old narratives. That's plunging us into a place between narratives, a place between stories, a place of I don't know, a place where we don't know even who we are anymore or what's real anymore. An ordeal. It's happening to many people on an individual level. It may be why you are here today. You know, Manish, I mean, that introduction was not joking when, he, when they said that he worked for J.P. Morgan. That wasn't the, you know, sumo wrestler version. Like that, was, that was real, you know. He was, he was um, in another world and something happened. An encounter with an illiterate grandmother. Something happened that collapsed his story. And maybe you're here for that reason too. And I think that our whole civilization is going through that process as well. Which is cause for hope. Here we're talking about hope. And we look at the breakdown and the crisis, and it looks pretty dark. But big change happens this way. So I think maybe we'll, I'll end with a call to action. Whatever we do, and I'm not going to tell you what action to take. I'm not going to contribute to a calculus in which going to the climate march is bigger and more important than taking care of your grandfather with cancer. We sense that every act sends ripples of causality out into the universe on, through a different, a different matrix of cause and effect than we've been taught through our Newtonian indoctrination. We know that every act has cosmic significance. But again, I'm not saying that taking care of your father with cancer is a substitute for other kinds of action. But no matter what action we take, no matter on what level we take, we can be allies in one thing, which is the disruption of the story that has carried us, that has inhabited us for a long, long time, increasingly. Disruptors of that story of separation and all that goes along with it. The othering of nature, the othering of other races, the marginalization of everything that does not serve that story. We can disrupt that story, and we are disrupting it in a million ways, and we can offer a new story, a new and ancient story. 
that draws from ancient roots. What's new about it is that we've never run a whole civilization on that. And so I see this gathering as, as maybe a, we've been here all together all day, um, as a coming together to remind each other that we're not crazy. You know, like I was sitting next to somebody after uh, Chris Hedges' speech, you know, and, and she was like, or he was like, yeah, this is great, you know, I agree with every word of it, but, but you know, I already know this. Everybody already knows this. But it's important to be reminded of it, too to um, preach to the choir so that the choir can make beautiful music together and go home after the gathering with that music still in your head so that when you go on to Huffington Post or whatever mainstream news or you're just bombarded by the effluvia of our culture, like there is that song going through your head of what happened here, what you remembered, what you knew in this moment so that carried by our alliance. We can stand in a story of interbeing, of ecology, of a million local expressions of a universal spirit. We can stand in that story and act from that story. And fulfill the hope that we know is not a delusion because we've seen it. We've heard it in these stories. We've seen what's possible, even though we don't know how to get there. We will recognize, held in this story, we will recognize each action step as it comes. Thank you.